Okay, uh, get started. Um, there's no room host, I guess so. Uh, my name's uh, Daniel Reich. Um, I'm going to be talking about this kind of interesting little project. Um, it's something that sort of fell in my lap uh, from doing other uh, IT related stuff and been working this for, for many years and, and talking to people about um, um, you know how I manage my online identities. Um, a couple of people suggested I should put together a talk about this and kind of share this and maybe start a debate. Um, so <clears throat> just want to get this out of the way. Um, because I work for a large company, they don't want their name associated with this. So these are it's my own work, on my own time. Nothing to do with my employer if you look up my bio, uh, just because my company was listed on the uh, on the profile. So first, a little bit of history of how I got involved in this. A um, long time ago, when you know dot coms and startups were all the rage, um, I somehow became an email admin. Uh, basically, people were asking me to set up email. Uh, because I could and I kind of did it pretty easily and it wasn't a big deal for me. So I ended up hosting a lot of domains for people who were doing startups just because they needed an email, they were trying to get started and um, you know, I could take care of it for them. So um, basically I ran this out of my house. Um, and you know, back in the uh, late 90s, um, you know, DSL was just kind of coming online. So it wasn't a lot of bandwidth, uh, servers weren't that powerful and so I, got hit with all the other things that come along with hosting email for lots of other people was my bandwidth got saturated, uh, got spam, server load, etc. And so, um, you know, it it became a, more of a nuisance for me at some point where I was basically, you know, doing all this stuff and it really wasn't what I was trying to do. I was trying to do my own startups at that time. So, <clears throat> um, you know, I was looking for ways I could better manage this because this was causing me problems. I mean, my internet link got fully saturated at one point. I couldn't do anything at all. So I happened to come across this idea um, from the financial industry. They have this thing called controlled payment numbers. And how many have heard of this before? Okay, a few of you. So uh, the idea behind this, is, it's pretty neat. It's it's an anti-fraud measure. Essentially, it's, it's a tokenization of your credit card. So when you go to make an online purchase, uh, instead of using your actual credit card number, right, you go to their website or you have an application and it generates effectively a one-time use credit card or it can technically be uh, one merchant as well. So you can use it multiple times but within the same merchant. And um, it's sort of a protection measure, right? So uh, if somebody happens to get your credit card uh, that you've tokenized effectively, um, it's no good to them because it's either only good with that merchant or it's only good for one transaction. So um, <clears throat> this is kind of a neat concept. It's been around. A number of uh, credit card companies do offer this, um, but it's you know it's not very popular. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, so when I talk about this to people, they've never heard of it, seen of it. Um, in fact, I think Discover um, discontinued it this year. So <clears throat> neat idea, but it's also a pain in the butt because you have to go to a website, log in, generate a card, copy paste it. And I guess that's kind of a pain. There are better ways to solve fraud um, that people are, are um, you know, leveraging. Um, and also doesn't help when people do silly things like this and post their credit cards on Twitter. So um, it really wasn't a, it's kind of a, a, of a novelty solution, I think, for, for the financial industry. Um, you know, I know that there's still some providers still offering this, but um, largely, um, you know, um, it was a neat idea, but probably too technical, and uh, they didn't market it well to to the consumers. So this got me thinking. You know, virtual email. Take the same concept, apply it to my email, right? To kind of solve my spam problem and kind of control the load. You know, and what if I gave everyone unique, randomized email address? Um, you know, the first thing I would get out of that would be, you know, source attribution. If someone were to, you know, abuse that email. So if somebody had a um, if somebody sold my email, right, think, you know, early 2000s, right, um, that was probably more common. Um, and, or if somebody did have a compromise and suddenly I was getting spam, I could just simply, you know, get rid of the email. But at least I knew where it came from. So, um, get rid of that. So, um, you know, I thought about, you know, how I can use this. And, um, and how I can put it together. And so there are some, some ways you can do this yourself, right? Gmail, you can add a hyphen and put whatever you want at the end, um, except that 
you know, anyone can figure out, drop anything after the hyphen, you have the root account. Um, so I can just keep sending an email there. Um, Outlook does a little better job where you can actually create a new uh, account effectively as an alias, uh, but you still have to go in and manage all those. So you can actually just go generate new and it's, it's effectively an alias. But what I ended up doing for myself was I originally took this, this uh, suite called uh, Horde um, and, and modified it and then added this, this um, customization to it. So when you go in and you look at the settings, right, you can uh, define things like when you send an email, here's your name. Well, I just basically added a button to that form that says generate a new uh, alias. And so on the back side, it would, you know, call a, a random function, generate something, and add it to my LDAP store. And uh, eventually I had to move to round cube because I got sick of all the patches on, on the Horde side, but um, effectively it's the same concept, right? Where I have a website, I go and uh, when I do this, I also add it to my address book. So now I have a means to track it. So as I'm adding these things, I have an address book entry that says uh, this uh, unique identifier is associated with this site. So now I can uh, keep keep tabs on, on how I'm using them. Um, initially, I decided to use 32 random characters. And um, funny thing about that is that a lot of websites, when you go to fill out a form, uh, they have limits on email length. Uh, including, by the way, the Eventbrite site, if you ever register for B-Sides event, it's 50 characters. Um, so uh, I reduced it to 16 just because that became uh, a problem. Um, and in fact, um, some sites um, are even funnier in that if I use the same, uh, if I use the same user ID as also the login ID, uh, some sites are even less than that. So you can have a user ID that's 16. Um, but they'll happily take more than uh, 16 or more characters when you actually go to log in, but not during the sign up process. So, um, for example, there was uh, one site um, where I had to reduce it to 15. Um, so I basically I just truncated it, right? But when I, when I use that uh, address book entry, I have to remember that I truncate it because if I use 16, it'll take it as an input when I go to log in, but it will say it's an invalid login. <clears throat> so, after I built this out, I kind of want to see, well, maybe I can find some interesting stats on, you know, if I gave my email address out, maybe I'd find some interesting uh, ways that people are sharing my information. And um, so I went and filled up contests. Um, got some free razors, it was pretty cool. Um, but effectively, I found that these were really not very useful at all. I mean, sure, I got lots of spam from it, but uh, as far as source attribution um, and finding actually anything useful out of this, it actually turned out to be really meaningless. It was just a lot of noise. Um, and I ended up just deleting all those aliases that I created um, and kind of moved on. Um, and and I continued to use this for, um, you know, every login site, any, any site that I had to create a login, I continued to generate random IDs. And and it actually took many years before I actually got a really good, interesting uh, result. Because I was offered a job. And uh, this was kind of neat. Um, so this is the first the first real uh, sort of incident that I found where I had some abuse of an email address, and um, you know clearly this is very legitimate, of course, right? <clears throat> so looking at the headers here, right, I found my email address, which if you're gonna send me spam to that, I've already deleted it since. But uh, so that was very interesting. I'm, I'm sure no one, you know, happened to randomly guess that one, um, but. Uh, since I had this in my address book, I went and looked up where this came from. And to my surprise, it was actually the Wall Street Journal. So um, this was 2009. Um, and um, so I, I, you know, I emailed them, sent you know, the, uh, an email to them to all their uh, accounts I could find, abuse, etc. cetera. Um, didn't get any response. But I kind of pieced together what happened here was that um, the, I had used, I had signed up for a, you know, a promo sort of deal with, uh, with the Wall Street Journal. And so it was done through a third, third party marketing company. And apparently they had a breach. And so their account data was stolen. And so therefore my email started getting spread around. So, you know, clearly here I could attribute this back to its source. I'd never used it anywhere else except with that marketing company when I signed up for um, so a subscription. So found a few more along the way as well. Um, demo recorder. 
uh, it's a site, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a product, uh, it's a German company. Um, in order to download it, uh, or a trial basically, you have to give them, fill out a contact form and they send you a link to download. Um, well, the form is actually a third party company. And, um, so I emailed, uh, it's, it's basically, it's a one man show. So I emailed Christian and I asked if he knew about this and yes, he didn't. So I, uh, uh, he went and and looked into it and found that, well, maybe it was tied to this marketing company and he reached out to them and sure enough, they actually did have a breach. Never bothered to tell him that. Uh, but he had found that they had a breach and all his, all his, uh, customer data had been stolen. Um, how long that had been going on? I, I don't know, but presumably it's been out there for some time. Uh, similarly, uh, geeks.com also had a, um, had a breach. Now, you know, this is a, a retail site. So this is a place that I've given them my credit card, right? So a um, little higher risk for me in that um, I'm giving them potentially information if they're retaining it, especially, um, you know, they, they could be abused to, to cause me harm. Um, so uh, similarly, uh, again, with all these uh, uh, different uh, incidents, uh, they each had their own unique email address. So... <clears throat> It got me thinking about how I use my logins and, and, you know, you know, what if I do reuse my password? Because, um, I have a lot of accounts and, um, yes, I use password safe for things that are really important to me, but I have a lot more accounts than I care to deal with. And I really don't want to be, you know, uh, messing around with having to, uh, pull open password safe every single time. So, um, it got me thinking about, um, how I can better use this tool. Um, so that I don't worry about passwords that I've reused. And so I've par basically partitioned my accounts into a couple buckets where I have things that I really care about and I will use strong passwords in conjunction with these randomized uh, login IDs and randomized email addresses. Um, and then there's everything else where I might have a password theme based on the type of site it is um, and what kind of information I let them store. So if they have my credit card on file, maybe I'll use a better password. If they don't, eh, maybe I don't care as much. Um, so it's, you know, this is something I've been doing for a long time. Um, you know, over 10 years now, I think. I actually don't remember when I started doing this, but I have 451 email addresses right now. So, um, you know, if I find they're being abused, I delete them. A lot of them are really stale and just, they, you know, they're silent. Yes? So um, for the random, it depends on how I bucketize them. So if, for example, it's a retail site um, where I don't let them keep my credit card info, I have a uh, I have a stronger password, but I might reuse that across multiple multiple shopping sites. Is it? But this certainly doesn't enable them to have access to any of my other accounts because remember, uh, if they have my my login ID or my email address and that shared password, so let's assume they have my password, uh, they have a login ID that's unique to that site, they have an email address that's unique to that site. Um, if they wanted to go after my email to find all my other emails and login IDs, um, well, that it's, it's an alias in the system, so you can't log in with that um, account. So, and there's nothing in there that would give you any, any indication as to what the, the core account is. So again, it's just randomized data. So, um, it kind of confines the attack. So assuming that they have my information, um, they still can't progress further. So I've contained a breach at that point, hopefully, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's allowed me to be a little bit less stringent as far as, you know, how I'm managing all these accounts. Um, but at the same time, it's also, it's kind of a pain in the butt. 16 randomized characters, right? Typing that in, um, especially when, you know, um, you know, let's just say uh, Spotify, right? Or Pandora, right? You have to have a login. And so my login ID is randomized. And so what I've kind of pieced together is basically a process for coping with this in that I have it in my address book. So if I'm at a PC, I can just go look it up in the address book, copy, paste. It takes an extra 20, 30 seconds for me to do that. It's a little bit of a pain, but um, it's readily accessible. Um, and it's also a little bit different. I'm gonna touch back on that and why it's kind of 
different and how it's, um, you know, why I think this is actually interesting. Um, but on the iPhone, of course, you know, I may not have access to that address book so easily, so I, um, I can just go search my inbox. So I have probably have an email that was sent to that account, so I'll just make sure I save an email, and then I can just pull it up really quickly, copy and paste that, and then do my login. It's also kind of fun when you're kind of interacting with merchants. So I've had this happen a couple of times where uh, checking out from a hotel and they want, you know, they want to move away from paper. So uh, it, it's kind of fun when they pull this up and they want to look, you know, send you and they want to confirm your email address for your invoice. And if, you know, I'm feeling, if I feel like I want to have a little bit of fun with them, I'll actually have them read it out. Um, it, it's also interesting in that um, I've also had it work the other way where I, um, I signed up to get access to my health records. And so you go to this website, you fill out a form, you put all this information that identifies, you know, your, your medical record ID number, et cetera. And then someone has to actually go review it. It's not an automated process. So it takes a couple of days. And so I went and filled out all this information and then I got a call back. I got a call from, from the, uh, the healthcare provider and they said, we have this request for a, uh, for an account and it looked really suspicious to us. Uh, can, can you confirm that that's actually you? And I, and I said, you, know, you mean the, 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 the login ID and email address? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, yes, it's, it's, it's legitimate. So uh, sometimes people pay attention, but mostly it's, it's, it, is, it is kind of fun uh, to see how people react to that. Um, yes? You mentioned you use password manager, but it's not convenient to pop it out uh, every time. Uh, what do you store efforts in the browser, like Chrome? Well, so it's, it's not necessarily... Um, I'm not always using one device, right? So I might be uh, logging in this MacBook. Um, I have a desktop computer. I've got my iPhone. I've got a tablet. I'm I'm pulling up accounts in a number of different places. So I really want to have something that's a little more portable. Uh, sure, I can keep it on a, you know, if I use a password manager, I, can, I keep it on a USB stick, right? And I can carry it around with me. Of course, that increases the risk of me losing that stick. And or I've also had this happen to me where. Um, uh, basically, my, my USB stick got damaged, and I wasn't as good about keeping it synced with a you know with a repository where I could keep a backup. So I've lost a few passwords that way as well. Um, right. Right. And and so for me, it's a it's a comfort level, right? And and I just don't trust third parties. So the reason I host my own email is because I don't trust other people to do it, um, that I want to own it and I want to keep it in my possession at all times. Um, it's just my personal comfort level. Obviously, um, a lot, I'm sure a lot of other folks feel differently. Yes. No, it, it saves it into my address book with, with a description of where I used it. Um, I don't show a timestamp of when I generated it, but um, it, uh, if I really want, I've never had a case where I've been curious about when I generated it. I probably have an email from when the account was created, um, but um, it, correct, right. And, and so right now the form that it's in, it's more of a, it's more of a hack on top of the webmail system. Um, I am planning to, to compile this into an actual plugin that I can release. Um, and so once I have that done, um, I'll, I'll publish that out so that if you do run uh, Roundcube, you can take this and install it. Um, of course, it does require, if you aren't hosting this yourself, that uh, whoever your provider is uh, has to accept that and, and provide the necessary privileges to your backend uh, LDAP store uh, to allow those modifications. Yes? Yes. So I do have that as well. Um, and that produces, I, I do get a lot of other interesting stuff that comes out of it because I see, and I haven't really understood why I get this, but I get a lot of email. To the, so when, on another domain that I have, I get a lot of email addressed to just random characters. I don't know why. A lot of them have Excel spreadsheets, oddly enough. Um, but it, these are things I've never used before. I don't know how, I don't know how somebody came up with it, but it's just random. Um, and there's a lot of different random, you know, number letter combinations at that domain. So, um, and it's just, that's also a nuisance as well. Um, but the other interesting thing that I, I have found with this is that, um, you know, so far I've talked about sort of the outgoing um, flow of information. So I'm logging into a website 
but there are cases where the you know whoever I'm interacting with isn't contacting me. So case in point, if I um, uh, if I provided my contact information, you know, phone, email, um, both your know, home cell, etc., to say my credit card company, and they have a fraud alert, and this is this has happened to me when I'm traveling overseas, they'll send me an email. They'll try and call me, and and so sometimes, all right, I definitely don't get the calls, um, and so I'll see the email. And so this is another way I can also validate that it's legitimate because some of these emails are, are if you're just looking at the subject and the from, you know, in the summary, do look fairly consistent, fairly legitimate. You really have to open it up to, to take a look. So, but it allows me to very quickly dismiss it because it wasn't sent to the correct address. So uh, it's, um, and you know, for me, it's pretty easy to spot some of those emails, but for other people that, um, for example, like my wife, who I've gotten to use the system, she can easily spot if it's a fraudulent email or not just because it wasn't sent to the right address. Yes? Yes. Right. And I haven't, I haven't worked on that yet, but that, that is a good idea. And that's something I've thought about is, is basically auto creating the rules to go along with it. So um, the, the catch is identifying all the potential domains that it might be coming in from. Um, I've noticed that some places use uh, multiple domains, and I don't always have them uh, configured correctly. Like I said, if it's to a specific one, because if it's coming from this, I know it's from this. Right. Yeah. I mean, exactly. No, it's it's uh, it's it's that's uh, absolutely gem. It's the things I've thought about um, as well. It's just uh, um, things I haven't gotten to yet. So, um, so. You know, this seemed like a really good idea when I built this out. Um, you know, basically what I'm talking about here is, is using your login ID as keeping it secret, right? It's not, uh, it's no longer public information. I'm, I'm saying use your login ID as, as another uh, factor in your authentication that, that should be kept secret, right? That you don't share with everyone. And, um, you know, obviously it goes without saying, right? Don't expect security if you're going to reuse your passwords um, or your login IDs because um, if, I can get hold of one account, I probably can get a hold of other accounts. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, this is just a way of me of moving out of the way of the target. So I put the, the picture of the running bulls there is that, um, you know, a, there's a lot of, uh, what I see is a lot of, a lot of people implement security because, you know, best practices, they kind of follow what everyone else is doing. These are generally accepted principles. And, and sometimes maybe it's not a good idea to follow what everyone else is doing, that you might want to do your own thing. Um, and so I kind of look at this as sort of getting out of the way and, you know, when somebody does get access to one of these accounts, um, they're going to look at it, probably spend a minute, you know, probably scripted, I would imagine, um, and they're going to move on because they're not going to find much value out of it and there's easier targets. Yes? I understand that you're randomly generating an email account. Right. Right. When you refer to reuse login IDs and passwords, my experience is that I could have a, a user ID, a password, and then an email address that they use to communicate. Mm -hmm. Which one of those are you referring to with the login ID? So in a lot of cases, the login ID will just simply be the user ID portion of the email address. So I just basically strip the domain off, and I'll use that as my login ID. So they're they're somewhat linked in that regards. Um, because it, it, at the end of the day, right, when you sign up for an account, they want an email address and they want a login ID. Uh, having two separate ones doesn't really. I didn't see a good reason to do that. I thought about it, but I, I couldn't find a good reason why I should. Right. Yes. Are, are you ready for for big questions arguments, or do you want to well, save that to later? I, I think I know where you're going, so let me. You know what I'm going to say. I, I do. So, so let me let me let me get to my next slide because I think that'll probably make this a little less controversial. Um, you know, this is this works for me. I don't think it'll work for everyone. Um, you know, it, it's it's just something that I I. I have used as a tool to better protect me. I think some other people could use this. I can't see this becoming a mainstream offering. 
uh, to be honest with you, right? Um, it, it requires a trust in, for most people, it's going to be trusting a third party. They can use Outlook or they can use Gmail. And that becomes the point of, of attack then, because if I want to get all your accounts, I'm just going to go after that email. Um, and so since I'm not a big provider, people don't, you know, attackers generally don't know me. Maybe they do now. Um, I'm going to have a lot more interesting uh, connections to my servers. Um, but you know, it, it works for me because I'm just sort of getting out of the way and, and, and my hope is that, um, you know, I'm not prescribing obscurity as a, as a primary factor, but it's, it's a means for me to get out of the way and let somebody else, you know, take the, take the hit, right? You know, if I'm, if I'm in, in the woods, right, and we see a bear, right, I don't have to outrun the bear, I just have to outrun every, you know, the, the, the slowest person. So that's really what I, my goal is. Um, and, and, really, you know, protecting myself. It, certainly there's some interesting lessons learned, um, but um, I haven't figured out how to make that sort of a mainstream. I think that, you know, some folks will, might be able to use this. So, um, so that was all the content. Let's get into the, the big question I know you're going to ask. <laughs> um, so the big question, uh, well, the, my experience I think a lesson to history is that bad things happen if you try to take stuff that was never designed to be a secret and start using them as secrets. And the best examples or maybe the worst offenders that we have of this are credit card numbers mm -hmm. and social security numbers. We've got systems where these things were never designed to be secret. And then slowly, various people in the institution started using them as secrets. And we're in a situation where people are using things for secrets through systems that were never designed that way. And we've actually gotten ourselves into a mess. And so I'm extremely hesitant. I, uh, I, I, I'm wary of schemes like this. And I understand, and, and the difference is, is that it's, I'm not entrusting the third party to, to reinvent the use of uh, things that weren't, weren't designed. It's something I'm doing myself as a means to have control over that. So if I have the option of giving you an email address, right, it's, it's going to be something that's not tied to anything else. So um, the, the whole point of this was really to um, protect myself and give me a means to control that. There's a lot of information that I'm retaining. And um, I need some way of managing it and keeping it sane. So I agree that you know you never want to take a system that's designed for a specific purpose and try and reinvent it in some fashion that it really was not designed for. Um, but you know the, all these a lot of these sites where you are um, signing up for accounts, they are asking you for an email address and a login ID. And you know if you strictly speaking, if you want to be secure, you're going to give them their own unique combination that would be never you know, never used anywhere else. And that's all I'm seeking to enable. Um, and so, yes, it's a modification of the system to, to enable that, but it's, it's really all I'm doing is, uh, you know, adding an alias and having a means to track it. Now, for sites that I care about, right, if it's a financial site, I will still use a very good password. I will keep it in the password vault. Absolutely exercise, you know, good hygiene. But I have over 400 accounts that I've signed up for. Most of those I don't care about. If you... If you get my, you know, if you can log into it and do something with it, I really could care less because there's no financial harm to me. Um, it, at worst, it'd be like a mosquito bite. Okay, just, you know, kind of clean up the account a bit, but move on. I don't have to go and change passwords at all these other sites. And, and it's really just making it easier for me because I don't worry about if there is a compromise at a site. That's great that you have my password. I don't have to rush out and change anything else. And it's just, it's it's a buffer for me that adds some protection. And as I said before, it works well for me. It can work well for individuals. Um, very hard to apply. But I think the the larger uh, topic that I, you know, the larger thought that I want to bring out of this is that, you know, since we are relying on these unique identifiers, right, what is your, how do you identify yourself, right? Is, you know, how we generate user IDs, is that really, you know, the direction we, sh we should still be going in? Because, 
Um, it's, it's a critical component and we made it public. Maybe that isn't the right approach. Maybe we need to think of a different way of identifying ourselves uniquely um, such that it would not be non-obvious um, and non-reusable. Yeah. I think I think you're warming up to the idea at least. <laughs> Right. Um, and you know, and, and so there's a lot of history to this. And also, of course, if you're trying to defend against um, uh, various sorts of fingerprinting mm -hmm. using different usernames everywhere, it makes it hard for people who are trying to connect various instances of you. You know, so so, so there's definitely merit for those specific goals. Right. Um, and then we can talk, we can argue about the others. I was going to ask you if you were familiar with something that existed a few years ago and sadly died. Uh, Papernapkin.com. No, I didn't hear, I was not aware of it. It was a mail service that somebody set up primarily for, well, usually women who were the couldn't get rid of some guy paying attention to her or asking her for a phone number or email sure. until she actually gave an email. And it was set up so that anything at papernapkin.com um, dot com generated an auto response that said that says the person who gave you this email does not want to hear from you. That's why they gave you this email. <laughs> Uh, there was there was a similar uh, I think uh, phone number service as well that did the same thing, um, and um, yeah I, I think um, you know I, I I what I was hoping to to kind of get out of presenting this really was to to kind of prime that discussion around well how do you how can you take something like this and make this more applicable right I think it's the user ID concept that I'm looking to change I don't know how to change it this probably won't extend but there's probably um, some other means, um, and it would it would probably also require participation from all these sites that are gener you know generating and storing account data. Um, but I think that the the notion of using your user ID to just you know something that you put out in the public, um, you know maybe maybe that time is uh, has passed. Maybe when you think about something new, yes. One was, uh, for the sites where you tend to go back like Amazon, for example, mm -hmm. um, do you cycle that user or uh, email address on your account periodically, or do you just basically stick with whatever you're doing? For the most part, I generally keep the same. Once I've given them an email address, I will keep it, unless I have reason to think I should change it, uh, which I have done on occasion, um, um, especially when um, uh, accounts start to get spam. Right, I just don't want to deal with it. But uh, you know, it, it's your log entity is effectively I treat it as public, right? It's it's just out there. It's not stored in any you know secure manner. So um, I don't treat it like that. Um, but um, it's it's just a it's I I I just use it personally. I just use it to you know allow me to make it disappear, basically like the paper napkin site. Uh, you know, once I've decided that I don't want it anymore, I delete, it removes the alias from my LDAP store, and it's gone. Anything that goes to that bounces. Uh, the second question I had was, uh, over all of the hundreds of accounts that you've set up, um, you mentioned that you sort of put them in buckets as far as the kind of use. Right. Uh, categorically, or just broadly speaking, can you say, sort of statistically, this use case is more apt to be end up being compromised or spam or whatever that right um, so I, I haven't I haven't dug into the statistics on how much spam was tied to some of these random accounts um, I mean, one would generally that, like the one time promotions and things would be more likely Right, but that's that's me deliberately giving out my information as opposed to well, I'm signing up for something very specific. I signed up to uh, to get access to uh, a forum where I want to post a message, right? Um, and then somebody stole the 
you know, the, the account database for that site. Um, and then they're using it or trying to use it in other ways. Um, and eventually probably gets leaked and somebody starts using it for spam. Um, you know, I, I don't have good, I haven't dug into, you know, how many of those are common. Because a lot of times, um, once I hear about that, I will go in, change the email address, delete the account, and just kind of move on. Um, and it really just comes down to, it's a little bit of me being lazy in that I don't necessarily always have time to go through all my emails. So if I see a notice from a site saying, hey, we've been compromised, everyone needs to change their passwords, I will go in and change my account at the same time, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the email address. And if I can, I'll try and change the login ID as well. Um, but um, for the most part, I'd say the majority of those aliases that I have fall into the bucket of I really could care less about them because they, they're they going to be sites for I wanted to download something and I had to give them an email address to a, a forum or something that I don't care. I just have I have the, a really simple plain password that I'm sure is in a dictionary, but um, that's okay. I've accepted the risk of that. Um, and then I have a sort of a next bucket of where um, I do conduct transactions. I buy things, but I don't give, I don't let them store information. So I may reuse uh, a strong password there. But it's at least going to be a strong password in that case. And then everything that can really harm me, I totally separate. Yes? Uh, I think this is a noble goal, and I think if you can get this implemented, everybody can use it single-handedly eliminate the online marketing and advertising and promotional business. So I think... Thank you. <laughs> I was telling someone last night that I know so many people who still have AOL accounts and sort of pull down to be vintage AOL. And they have one account for everything they can do. Right. Whereas you're in the opposite end of the spectrum of disposable accounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, right. It, it, this is this is just an enhancement to other good hygiene practices. Really, it's you know we we always I, I always hear people saying, well, it's a, you know it's a, we describe security as an onion, right? You have many layers to this. This is a, not a tool. This is not a tool that's effective by itself. It's it's only effective in conjunction with others. And again, I just want to outrun the bear, so or, or outrun the other person who's you know being chased by the bear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it can be by telephone, email, what have you. But, um, and so that credit card statement, you know, is more likely than the others. Right. Right. I mean, in, in, in general, right, with credit cards, you're, you have, um, you're, you're exempted from liability, right? They'll, they'll assume if you identify the fraudulent charges. So um, I don't worry as much about that anymore because, you know, you call them up and say, that I didn't, this wasn't me. They'll cancel the card. They'll remove the charges. It's five minutes of my time. It's done. Except for when you've got to change the numbers. Exactly. Right. Not five minutes. It goes on for months. I agree. We have hundreds of transactions every month, and they're segregated this way. So your Amazon example, they're all in that card. Right. And and that's where the um, the control payment numbers I thought really would have been a good solution for the industry. Um, and it's kind of surprising that that's never really gotten a lot of adoption where you can just say, I'm going to generate a card. It's good for a year. It, I can set a high limit as to how much can, you know, can be spent over the lifetime of that card. And I use it with one merchant. So great. It gets stolen. The, the only risk there is that if somebody breaks into the merchant and orders more stuff from that merchant and changes your address, right? Um, but it, it you, then, you know, if you have any compromise, well, again, you've given everyone a unique credit card number and, I just have to change the one. So there are still companies that, uh, you know, there are still financial companies that do provide that. Uh, I think Citibank may, might still do that. Um, but it's, you, you kind of have to dig around to find it. Um, so, yes? Have you encountered or considered any implications with respect to like credit bureaus stuff? And you know, they're trying to tie more and more of this stuff together. It seems like you're a nightmare scenario um, for data brokers and things like that. So right. Have you run into scenarios where it's become difficult for you to take credit? Or like, I mean, that seems unlikely. No. I mean, because, you know, as far as credit, they, they always go off of your social. And, um, 
and uh, you know they generally. Uh, I guess from a backgrounds check perspective, maybe that might cause some interesting results. Um, you know, I've I've had a over over the uh, you know course of my career, I've had a few background checks when you know joining a new company, and um, honestly, I think all those services are kind of a waste of time. I I, mean, I remember uh, one employer hired a company to do a background check on me, and you know I had done some startups, and they called me to check on my own employment. From a startup, so I don't put a lot of faith in those anyways, and I don't think people, the employers do as well. It's more about uh, they just, you know, did, did you commit a felony, right? They just want to know that. So, is there another question? Or? Oh, well, I would just add um, uh, the about 10 years ago, there was research um, in the spam community uh, that set up lots of experiments like yours. Mm -hmm. You know, where things can be get spread by so, um, I can't cite any of it, but mm -hmm. I know that something for you. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I know. Okay. Well, I just kind of curious about yeah, I'd be I'd be curious if, if you had uh, any links. To that. I'd be curious. To see it. I mean, I know a lot of people are, have been looking at this over the years, right? There's there's the ton of tools out there, right, for detecting spam, and and they work to some degree or another, but they're you know, undoubtedly will ultimately fail. And that wasn't my, you know, originally, yes, I wanted to control my spam, but I think, uh, you know, kind of what it turned into was just, I didn't want to have to deal with changing my passwords. And it's just me trying to uh, not get in the same, you know, uh, not be in that crowd, you know, and running with everyone else in that, you know, and undoubtedly, you know, a few people will get picked off, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, why would you choose to trust one password manager over another? Like, you're running an Apple, why don't you trust Apple? Uh, I, I could, but I, I kind of go from the assumption that, uh, yeah, maybe my machine might get compromised. And if it does, and I keep that as the store, then somebody could potentially walk off with it and, you know, exfiltrate the data. So if I, you know, if I want to think about this from a more paranoid perspective, if I keep it on a um, on a USB stick and it's only accessible when I plug the stick in, it's just a different model. Yep. So it's it's encrypted. Uh, I mean, I use a, a hardware encrypting token with the self destruct feature. So. Ten wrong entries in a row, and the the device destroys itself. You mentioned in a couple of years, these things because they do get go bad. Correct. Right. It's just a pain. It. Yeah. So so I use the password manager, but again, the database is kept on the USB stick. So instead of using the keychain, right? I I use an application. Um, for better or for worse, I use the the password safe. Uh, which is reasonably well known. It may not be the best anymore. I don't know. It's just something I've been using for many years. Um, and I figure I have uh, enough other controls in place that, all right, if there was an issue with that, then I've, I've made it sufficiently difficult, right? If, you know, the, if somebody wants to specifically target me, odds are they probably can, you know, uh, break through my defenses, but they're not usually targeting you specifically. They're trying to go for a mass grab of information, right? So if the government is going to target me, I'm going to be, you know, victimized by the government. And that's just something I accept. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you.